Good day, good evening, good morning, good night, wherever you are. I'm Mohammed Rizwan Rafi, and today we're going to talk about a bacteria that should have been more popular than the Kardashians. I'm, of course, talking about B. subtilis. We're going to talk about the history behind B. subtilis, its classification, morphology, habitat, ecological roles, metabolism, life cycle, and everything there is to know about this wonderful, wonderful bacteria. So sit back and relax, and hope you learned something today. Uh, first of all, I'm going to introduce you to B. subtilis. B. subtilis is also known as hay bacillus or grass bacillus, but historically it was once known as Vibrio subtilis in 1835 when it was first discovered by Christian Ehrenberg. Later on, it was renamed by Frederick Ferdinand Cohn in 1872 into B. subtilis. Now, there is a famous story behind B. subtilis. And I named the story the camel dung story. Because what happened in, during the Nazi Ger Germany times is soldiers were being infected with dysentery. And what German soldiers found out that Arabs used to chug down warm camel dung with a view to cure the dysentery. And then they realized that actually the camel dung know the B. subtilis present in the camel dung creates the antibiotics which destroys the pathogen responsible for dysentery. And thus concludes the camel dung story, and this is a basic introduction of B. subtilis. Next, we'll move on to classification and morphology. Uh, looking at the classification of B. subtilis, we're looking at domain phylum, class order, family, genus, and species, belong to the domain bacteria, phylum is pharmacutes, Class is Bacilli, order is Bacillales, farm family is Bacillaceae, and genus is Bacillus, and the species is, of course, Bacillus subtilis. This classification helps us relate B. subtilis to its relatives. We're looking at a quick morphology on this bacteria. It's a gram positive, it has a peptidoglycan cell wall, it is rod shaped. It would look like this shape, and it is filled with flagella, which helps it to move. It is an endospore forming species, so it will form endospores to withstand harsh climates and conditions. If we're looking at dimensions, we're looking at 4 to 10 microliters long, 0.25 to 1 microliters in diameter. No surprise there, it is a bacteria, a microbe. And there is a debate between whether to conclude B. subtilis as a facultative anaerobe or an aerobe, and sometimes it's also called an anaerobe. So there is a debate there, but when we move on to metabolism, we can adjust some of those controversies. Next, we'll be moving on to habitat and ecological role. Now, where can we find B. subtilis? Uh, it's popularly found in the soil, but we also have this in our intestinal tracts, which is a common soil there, and it can also be found in water. Uh, just to clarify, it is not a pathogen, so inside us it lives in a symbiotic relationship. Uh, it generally lives in oxygen and nutrient rich uh, areas with mild temperature. In the face of scarce nutrients, it forms endospores, as we were talking before. It forms endospores and antibiotics that kill other gram-positive bacteria that are fighting for the same nutrients. Ecological role, it plays a good role. It plays a role in breaking down and degrading polymers. It, it plays a role in carbon and nitrogen cycle, in the terrestrial carbon and nitrogen cycle, that helps in replenishing nutrients and helps in, and therefore helps in plant growth. Later we will be talking about metabolism and life cycle. B. subtilis metabolism. They make ATP through vitamidal fermentation or nitrate ammonification. They use nitrite or nitrate as their terminal electron acceptor. Now, they have two unique nitrate reductors. One of them is involved in nitrate-nitrogen assimilation, whereas the other is involved in nitrate respiration. 
and they have only one nitrite reductase, which converts right nitrite into ammonia. This nitrate, however, was derived from the nitrate respiration in the, from the nitrate reductase. They also have lactase dehydrogenase, which converts pyruvate to lactose, lactate. They have catalase, which we all know converts peroxide to water and oxygen. They also have dismutase, which converts superoxides into oxygen and peroxide. Next, we're going to talk about life cycle of B cellulis, and eventually we'll talk about the symbiotic relationships, and we'll conclude using the uses of B cellulis. Uh, we're going to talk about life cycle, how B cellulis leads its life, and I have to sit down for it because it's a very relaxed life cycle. They can go two ways. One way they can do binary fission, where we have a single cell and elongated chromosome being decided exactly at the center to create two daughter cells, or in the occasion that there is a scarcity or a lacking of certain nutrients or harsh environments, they would form spores. But as we were discussing, there's spore forming bacteria. While the formation of spores, they have two regions of division. However, one is inactive and one actually undergoes a certain division where they form something called a pore spore. That pore spore gets engulfed and eventually leads to a formation of a spore. This spore would germinate only in the presence of suitable conditions and nutrients. Otherwise, it will remain a spore. The molecular biology of B cellulis, uh, there are specialized proteins in B cellulis that helps bind and protect DNA. There are other specialized molecules in B cellulis which we discussed while we discussed metabolism. Those helps in metabolic uh, processes. And we also will discuss symbiosis of B cellulis. Uh, B cellulis is involved in a symbiotic relationship with rhizome because B cellulose forms biofilms which inhibit plant pathogen infection. Now it's very interesting how they inhibit the infection. They do it by something called preemptive colonization. Preemptive colonization is B cellulose takes up the spot where there could have been a potential infection. Since they have already occupied that spot, no other pathogen can infect that spot. Particularly, that spot is taken up in the rhizome system of plants, and that's the benefit plants get. And in return, what does B cellulose get? They get nutrients and surface area for the biofilm formation from the plant root structure. Okay, so why are we talking about B cell list too much? Like, why is it so important? Of course, I need to turn in this project for a grade. But other than that, B cell list has a widespread use and it has applications, and that makes it so cool. Apart from all the ecological importance it has and the symbiosis relation, symbiotic relationship it has with plants, it is also a perfect model for research. Why? Because B cellulis can uh, respond to gen gene mutations and it is also very durable. What else? Industrially important compounds like Amlis is synthesized from B cellulis that is used in textile and paper industries. A probe is called cellulisin used in detergent production and leather industries is also synthesized from B cellulis. And also, B cellulose produces antibiotics like difficidin and bacillomycin and so on and so forth. What else? There are probiotics that are created from B and B cellulose. Those probiotics help boost digestive and immune function. And apart from all these great uses, it also has uh, uses in the growth of plants, which we have discussed a little bit while we were discussing the symbiosis. It acts as a fungicide 
for plants inhibiting the growth of infecting fungus. So with all these wonderful, wonderful applications in hand, B. satellites is definitely, should be more famous than all the reality stars out there.